talking. Please participate as you feel comfortable. We invite you to stay and introduce yourself in conversation following the service. We are trying out a few updates to our service script today, so uh, fasten your seat belts, not too tightly, <laughs> not that big a deal. Um, our congregation is committed to individual free freedom of belief, welcomes diversity, seeks to promote a sense of community, and fosters religion, which in Riches the spirit. As we begin our service, please take a couple of breaths and bring your attention into this moment of communal reflection and sharing. We acknowledge that we're on the traditional homelands of the Swabash, Coast Salish native people, the Puyallup and Muckleshoot people continue to steward these lands today. We commit to uplifting native voices, experiences and histories, as well as promoting social justice actions with the indigenous people of this land and beyond. Whoever you are, whomever you love, however you arrived here, you belong here. I'd like to uh, ask Ted to come up and light the chalice. Let us light our chalices together with words by Reverend Dr. Rebecca Parker, choose to bless this world. You must answer this question, what will you do with your gifts? Choose to bless this world. The choice to bless the world is more than an act of will, a moving forward into the world with the intention to do good. It's an act of recognition, a confession of surprise, a grateful acknowledgement in the midst of a broken world. Unspeakable beauty, grace, and mystery abide. Victoria? I'm Reverend Victoria Poling. I minister to this congregation and to Kitsap UU Fellowship. I use she, her pronouns. I identify as queer, white, and Hispanic, and most importantly, as a Pacific Northwesterner. Please join me in a responsive reading, continuing the words of Reverend Dr. Rebecca Parker, Choose to Bless This World. Your words are in bold on screen where it says all. There is an embrace of kindness that encompasses all life, even yours. And while there is injustice, anesthetization, or evil, there moves a holy disturbance, a benevolent rage, a revolutionary love, protesting, urging, insisting that which is sacred will not be defiled. Those of us who bless the world live their life as a gesture of this thanks for this beauty and this rage. The choice to bless the world can take you into solitude to search for the sources of power and grace, native wisdom, healing, and liberation. More, the choice will draw you into community. The endeavor shared, the heritage passed on, the companionship of struggle, the importance of keeping faith, the life of ritual and praise, the comfort of human friendship, the company of earth, the chorus of life welcoming you. None of us alone can save the world. Together, that is another possibility waiting. Please rise in body or spirit and join in singing hymn number 128, For All That Is Our Life, found in your gray hymnal. That's 128.
Our story this morning is a folk tale, a folk tale from France that is hundreds of years old. The story has been adapted in many ways and many times, so this is a version for us today. Our story is Stone Soup. Not so very long ago, not so very far from here, three warriors were camped in a forest. They'd been fighting different wars of survival for a long time. One had fought people halfway around the world and came home anguished but what he had had to do. One had fought to unionize her company and was fired. The third had participate, participated in the Occupy, the Women's March, the Black Lives Matter protests, and was angry that nothing seemed to change. The woods felt safe from other people, but they were tired of sleeping in the cold, and they were hungry. I would really like a good dinner tonight, said the first warrior, and a bed to sleep in, said the second. That's impossible, said the third. Let's move on. So they got in their worn and trusty van, and they drove until they found a neighborhood. But the people of that place were afraid of strangers, and they kept voting to spend more tax dollars on public safety. <laughs> Someone saw them coming and sent out a group text. Watch out. Some people who are unhoused are on their way, and they'll be hungry. We have hardly enough for ourselves. So the people hurried to hide their food. The trio arrived at the neighborhood and stopped at the first house. They put on their masks for courtesy and knocked. <laughs> Good evening, they said. Could you spare some food for three hungry warriors? Sorry, Maria and Jose shrugged. We don't have enough for ourselves. Food and gas prices went up again. So they continued on to Jill and Amy's house. They knocked on the door. Do you have a place we could sleep in for the night? Oh no, our guest bed is taken. We have to do that whole weekend B&B &B situation to pay off our high interest home loan. <sighs> At Vincent and his grandma Alice's house, they learned that he'd been laid off and was looking for work. Social security kept the lights on and the property taxes paid and not much else. No one had any food to give away and they all had genuinely good reasons. So the three warriors thought and they thought and then they had a new idea. They invited everyone to come out of their homes, outside into the street where they called out, good people, listen. We are three hungry warriors far from home. We asked you for food and you have none. So we're gonna make some stone soup. Well, the neighbors were surprised and curious. Stone soup? First, we will need a big pot. <laughs> the people brought the largest pot they could find. Now we need fire and water. So the people brought out a grill and lit the flame, and they set the pot to boil. Now, would someone please find us three round stones? Some people ran off to get some stones, and they brought them forward to drop into the pot. Is there anyone here who has a stone? I have a stone. Oh, good. <laughs> right here. Right into the pot. Those are some nice stones. Those will make some very good soup. Oh, good. There's one more. That's excellent. This is going to be delicious. <laughs> of course. If there were some carrots, it would be much better. Well, I think I have a carrot or two, said Jill. And she came back with a public radio tote bag full of carrots that she'd <laughs> hidden under the bed. A good stone soup should have an onion, said the warriors as they sliced the carrot into the pot. But no use asking for what you don't have. Well, I think I could find one somewhere, said Vincent. Mackie came with an onion from the back of the produce bin. But if only we had a potato, this soup would be good enough for the judges of that great soup cooking show. <laughs> People went to get potatoes. Well, now this soup is fit for the famous, said the warriors. People looked at each other in amazement. 
gourmet soup, and all from a few stones. It seemed like magic. At last, the soup was ready, and how good it smelled. People took off their masks and sat down to eat at a closeness that was comfortable to them, and never had there been such a feast. They ate and they drank, and they ate and they drank, and the warriors and the people of the neighborhood were no longer hungry. They were no longer afraid. In fact, they were quite full, and they were very happy to be eating together outside. And after dinner, they danced and celebrated and told stories about each other's lives long into the night. And finally, they offered the warriors some nice beds where they could sleep. The next day, the warriors gathered around with the people for a send-off. The people said, "Many thanks for what you've taught us. We shall never go hungry now that we know how to make soup from stones." Oh, it's all in the knowing how," said the wise warriors, and off they went down the road to find another town where they could stir up another stone soup, and maybe one day, like this coming Thursday at 5:45 at Lewis <laughs> Hall, they will be coming here. Let's have some special music. <laughs> Oh, good. And there was some cabbage, and there's a squash. I saw some other vegetables. That'll be good. You've long been on the open road. You've been sleeping in the rain. From the dirt of words and mud of cell, your clothes are dark and stained. But the dirt of words and muddy cells will soon be judged insane. So only stop and rest yourself till you'll be off again. And take off your thirsty boots and stay for a while. Your feet are hot and weary from a dusty mile. Maybe I can make you laugh. Maybe if I try, I'm just looking for the evening and the morning in your eyes. But tell me of the ones you saw, as far as you could see, across the plain from field and town. Marching to be free, and of the rusted prison gates that tumbled by degree, like laughing children one by one who looked like you and me. Why don't you take off your thirsty boots and stay for a while? Your feet are hot and weak. From a dusty mile, and maybe I can make you laugh, and maybe if I try, I'm just looking for the evening and the morning in your eyes. I know you are no stranger down the. Crooked rainbow trail from dancing cliff edge, shattered sills of slander, shackled jails. But the voices drift up from below as the low walls are being scaled. All of this and more, my friend, your song shall not be failed. So take off your thirsty boots and stay a while. Your feet are hot and weary, or from a dusty mile. And maybe I can make you laugh. Maybe if I try, I'm just looking for the evening and the morning in your eyes. Thank you, Kat. 
Let's take off our thirsty boots and stay for a while. How do we remind ourselves that we live in a generous world? It's easy to fall into that scarcity mindset, right? The Stone Soup story is a tale of vulnerable people getting by on their wits and courage, finding a way to co-create an experience of generosity out of little bits and pieces. And in this version, the three warriors living in the woods have fought different kinds of battles that others don't know about. Can you see yourselves in them? Most of us have fought some kind of battle in one way or another. Maybe we felt in the woods, metaphorically, at some point in life. Where is the generosity in that, in fighting battles that are unseen? In Kent, where I live, some people are living in the woods across the street from my neighborhood. And the vulnerability of living like that is scary to me. So I voted again this week. Sidebar, please vote for your local elections. I voted again this week for city council candidates who expressed a willingness to work on housing. And I wondered, am I being generous when I do that? I'd like to be. I've lost my housing unexpectedly before, at the end of seminary. At the beginning of the pandemic, I was out of money. And thanks to friends who generously offered me their guest room for a while, I wasn't at risk. That friendly generosity, that was a safety net. In the story, the neighbors are afraid of the unhoused warriors. Perhaps they feel a shiver up their spine, reminding, being reminded that life is uncertain and that social safety nets are limited and that risk can be very close to home. These neighbors feel precarious and displaced as well. World economics affect their daily lives. Social services aren't working for them either. They're wary of strangers scared about increasing their food insecurity, so they hide their food, forgetting that generosity is a safety net. And the warriors, of course, are most certainly at risk in approaching the neighbors to ask for help. And yet, what choice do they have? They need to eat. How will they unlock the generosity of this world that is just there below the surface? They don't want people to call the police on them. So they know in their bones that they have to be polite and smart, entertaining, and a little bit trickstery in order to get what they need. To unlock the generosity, they become gracious. Canadian Unitarian Universalist Liz James reflects, we're taught that this tale is about tricking a meal out of selfish people, but I don't think that's really what happened. I mean, if someone asked me if I had a meal to share with them and I only had half a teaspoon of salt or a few old vegetables that are always in the back of my fridge, I would say I couldn't help. I wouldn't be lying when I said I had nothing to give. I would just be wrong about that. The stone soup story isn't about selfish people. It's about people who thought they were powerless. It's about people learning that they had something to offer that would feed themselves and each other. I appreciate Liz James' reflection because it reminds me of congregational life. So much of our ministry here in community with each other is about learning what we have to offer that feeds ourselves and each other. About recognizing and claiming our power together with each other. We are not powerless because generosity is powerful and we live in a generous world. In his book, The Way of Gratitude, UU Minister Reverend Galen Gungerich reflects on the vastness of the universe and that in the face of this vastness and in witnessing the fragility of life, we feel this sense of utter dependence. And from this feeling, we are moved to gratitude for what is here and what we have. And gratitude is where generosity starts. When was the last time you gave in such a way that it changed your heart? Well, I've seen that the generosity here 
at VIUU abounds. Just look at the table in the back at all the treats that were brought this morning. And I've witnessed your creativity and care, your puns and storytelling, your governance. I've witnessed the sharing of art and music and poetry that moves and inspires. And I'm ever grateful for the weekly loyal, devoted hospitality volunteers who usher and count the offering and make tea and coffee. When we create our Sunday services together, it changes our hearts and it changes our relationships week after week, one Sunday at a time. We get to count and recognize our many small acts of generosity. As Liz James further reflects, when we say that there's nothing we can do, we're not lying. That phone call we might make, or the $5 we might donate, or a quick email of encouragement we might send, these things feel so small that we think they're the same as having nothing to offer. They're not the same. They're more. These acts of service that feel small are part of learning to speak a language of love. Generosity is a love language, a language that changes relationships and circumstances. Generosity is a loving way of creating spiritual freedom, no matter how much you have to give. So this stone soup story reminds us that our freedom and our power here in community come from giving our imperfect and partial love offerings. A carrot, an onion, a soup pot, three smooth stones, and together we make something more. In our congregation, we're both warriors and neighbors. We come from mixed backgrounds and experiences of home, and what is safe for one person might be risky for another. We have mixed experiences of belonging, and we have mixed expectations of what our spiritual village ought to be like. And as we mix and mingle together, sometimes we're just plain mixed up, like a pot of soup. I'd like to step way out beyond our congregation for a moment. You are probably familiar with the famous metaphor by William James about how we are mixed up as a country, that the United States is a melting pot of cultures. And for as long as I can remember, I wrote an essay on this in eighth grade, I resisted that metaphor as it implies assimilation, some kind of homogenization under the influence of capitalism made somewhat bearable by the hopeful promise of representative democracy. As a white person of Hispanic heritage, I'm so aware of how my ancestors assimilated and let go of their language, stopped speaking Spanish, stopped going to Roman, or excuse me, Spanish Catholic services, and gradually became white. So I've been working on learning more about the impact of Spanish colonization and what is new, now New Mexico, where my ancestors settled for centuries. And it's from that heritage that I'd like to introduce you to a different image for mixed spaces, where people of indigenous and European backgrounds have mixed. Not a melting pot, but a threshold between worlds. A tierra entre medio, or a land in the middle, a borderland. There's a word for this middle and mixed up space that comes from the Nahuatl language, which is nepantla. It's spelled N-E-P-A-N-T-L-A, -A, Nipantla. And you're welcome to try out this word with me. This is by invitation. We can say it together. It's Nipantla. Thank you. So in this mixed space here, we are in a borderland of Nipantla. One of my UU mentors, Tanya Marquez, taught me this concept. And she received it from Chicana scholar Gloria Anzaldúa. Nipantla as that threshold space between worlds is unfamiliar land, tierra desconocida, with unstable and shifting boundaries. The transition zone is not temporary. It's not a bridge to somewhere else. It's like living here in the, the Puget Sound. We're in an estuary. It's always an estuary of mixing salt water and fresh water. It's not a transition to something else. 
as we live here in this Nipantla, this borderland of salt and fresh, we are constantly encountering the unfamiliar, experiencing a little bit of displacement. Sometimes that's uncomfortable. Sometimes it evokes curiosity. As a Chicana, Gloria Anzaldúa's experience is that most of us dwell in Nepantla so much of the time it's become a sort of home. And that this state of being home and the mixing can link us to people and ideas and worlds. In this place, freedom and power come from those ordinary, imperfect, generous offerings of love between people that create that new sense of being at home. Just like in Stone Soup, where people brought their vegetables and created a celebration in the borderland of the street outside their homes. Between the houses and the forest, there was a street, and they had a street party. In these borderlands, when people are stirred up and new contacts are inevitable, there's both risk and possibility. It's possible we'll rub up against someone in a way that causes us some harm. And it's also possible that never before seen creations and collaborations will emerge. So these stone soup warriors and these neighbors, they came out into the mixing zone. They took that risk. They showed trust out of necessity. And they created something out of this intriguing and strange invitation that brought people together, that broke through fear, and created something magically new out of ordinary ingredients, the improbable and genius stone soup. As a UU congregation, we get this opportunity to, to learn to be at home in an unstable mixing zone. We get to be more powerful and more brave when we're able to receive another person's gifts. The stirrings of creative life here, and I can't emphasize this enough, the stirrings of creative life here in our congregation, the meals and songs and laughter and more are actually a form of community safety. Our creative life is a form of community safety. When we laugh and play together, we're better able to stand up to the heat of transformation. When you get stirred up in a pot, when something new is being cooked. This is how we adapt to giving and receiving in a place that is in between, in between worlds that's becoming like home. I think our post-pandemic time is just that. We are in the Pantla time, a threshold between worlds, <coughs> making stone soup. So I've invited you here today to bring what you have for a literal soup. There is a bowl on the greeter table. If you brought a vegetable, I will be taking the vegetables home and making some stone soup for our friends giving dinner this Thursday here at Lewis Hall. If there are more vegetables than I can use, I'm inviting other cooks, and uh, I'm just inviting other cooks, period, to bring things to the potluck. So as, as you know, when we combine our efforts, we make something greater from the whole. Because what we need now is right here in our own beloved comunidad. Blessed be. <laughs> Let's hold a moment of silence with tenderness with a prayer for being enough, having enough, and the grace of each other's generous presence. Please rise in body or spirit and join me in singing hymn number 95. There is more love somewhere found in your great hymnal. There is more love somewhere. 
we will now pause the recording as we prepare our hearts for joys and concerns. As you feel comfortable in singing, there is a love. now resume recording as we finish the service. As members and friends of the Vashon Island Unitarian Universalists, we commit to supporting our congregation, um, period. <laughs> Let me say that again. <laughs> um, financial resources help us pay speakers and staff, support social justice programs, and maintain our building. Please support VIUU with your pledges and offerings so that we can continue to be a vital community. Our congregation in, engages beyond our walls for peace, social and economic justice, freedom of belief and protection of our planet and its inhabitants. Once a month, we contribute the financial offering to a community organization that aligns with our values. This, this week's offering supports our beloved community. And our greeters are already passing the basket. Why don't we, we can begin singing. We get, we, we give thanks. Thank you. There's a love. <laughs> we give thanks for this precious day from gathered here and those far away for the time we share with love and Our closing words are a prayer by Liz James. Grant us the bravery to step forward and offer whatever we have. Grant us the wisdom to see ourselves as part of something greater. And grant us the compassion to see and draw out the gifts that are found in every person. And Mary, would you please come forward for the extinguishing of our chalice? Okay. Ted, would you like to come forward? Oh, you're going to do it. Never mind. Doesn't matter. <laughs> it's all right, Ted. Um, when we take the fire from our chalice, it does not become less. It becomes more. So, and so we extin extinguish our chalice, but we take its light and warmth with us, multiplying their power by all of our lives and sharing it with the world. <laughs> That's how you ring a chime. <laughs> so thank you to Alex Clark, our wonderful technician, Ted uh, Claybaugh for 
ex lighting the chalice and then Victoria for extinguishing it. <laughs> Kate Eggleston for her wonderful music as always. And, <laughs> and Reverend Victoria for participating in today's service. Please, jo <laughs> Please join us for refreshments following our VIUU events no announcements. Does anyone have an announced an announcement related to VIUU?